Hey guys, what's up? So what I want to do in this video is I want to go ahead and talk a little bit more about antidepressants, how they work, and how they work to improve depressive symptoms. So in the last video, I kind of discussed some of my views on antidepressants in general, some typical indications and places where they might be very, very effective for certain patients, right? So in this video, what I really want to do now is kind of go a step further and now talk about each class of antidepressant medications in general. So just a quick little tidbit here about medication classification. For me, I tend to group these into three primary antidepressant groups. And the first being the typical antidepressants, which will include things like the SSRIs, SNRIs, and TCAs. The second group is the MAOI inhibitors, and the third being the atypical antidepressants, which will include medications such as bupropion, also known as Wilbutrin, and Trazodim. Um, these are the most widely used psychiatric medications of all the different medications we use. Antipsychotics, mood stabilizers, etc. Antidepressants are extremely uh, popular within psychiatry and also very popular amongst uh, people like family practitioners and, and general practice um, will also prescribe these medications. They do have good efficacy in the treatment of major depressive disorder. There's some quite controversy when compared to placebo, but for the most part, um, evidence has shown that these are very, very useful in treatment of major depressive episodes and major depressive disorder. So what can one expect if they choose to use one of these medications? Well, most people have actually fully recovered. About 50% will have full recovery with an adequate dose and adequate treatment of at least six weeks. So the really important point there is that you have to have an adequate dose, meaning you need to titrate up to the point where you're effectively getting a proper concentration of the drug in the body, and also you need to at least make sure that you do use it for six weeks. So it has to be used for a proper length of time as well. And both of those things are really, really important because a lot of times people will come back in and say, well, I've been using the medication for the last, say, two weeks, and I haven't noticed any difference yet. Well... Right, because you haven't really given it an adequate trial yet. You need to wait at least six weeks to see if this medication will be effective before making any kind of changes. That means increasing the dose, changing to a different medication, changing to another class of antidepressant medication even. Um, the other 20 to 35% of people will have some improvement in their depressive symptoms, but they actually won't have a full response. And 10 to 12% of people actually don't show much response at all. So there are some people who, you know, antidepressants may not be the best choice for their treatment. The class I want to talk about in this video specifically is really the most commonly used antidepressant class, and that's the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So the mechanism of action is really, really simple, and it's exactly what it sounds like here in terms of um, the name. What you're going to be doing is inhibiting the serotonin reuptake through the inhibition of a particular serotonin transporter called CERT. So that's how it basically works. Now, the blockade at the synaptic cleft, meaning this is the blockade of the receptor there, that's going to be re uh, reuptake um, through the transporter, the blockage of this transporter, is actually going to be occurring within hours. So it happens relatively rapidly. But the reality is that we don't see a response in depression for about three to six weeks. So what that tells us is that the mechanism by which this medication actually improves depressive symptoms is not simply related to just increasing serotonin concentrations, right? Because if it were that simple, then theoretically people should have relief of symptoms within hours. So they take the medication, they get inhibition of this particular transporter, and they have increased serotonin, and now they should theoretically be better. But the reality is we don't see that. It actually takes a lot longer than that. So that tells us that there's something more to the mechanism than just simply um, blocking the reuptake of serotonin and increasing serotonin within the synaptic cleft. But for the purposes of this video, it's, it's simple enough to understand that the, that's the basic mechanism. Um, all antidepressants also share similar efficacy, meaning that when we make a decision to try to put somebody on one of these medications, we're mostly looking at other factors, right? We, we could choose any one of these medications, but we're trying to find the one that is either going to treat other comorbidities, say a patient has anxiety or panic disorder. We may choose a medication that's indicated for both depression and panic disorder, depression and anxiety. And we're also going to look at medications that uh, have good side effect profile, meaning that people are not going to want to stop taking the medication because the side effects are just so intolerable. 
Uh, other factors that will come into play will be, you know, is this a female? Is she of childbearing age? Is she thinking about becoming pregnant? We may want to consider that. Is this an elderly person? Um, is this person with impaired renal function, impaired hepatic function, etc.? So we do want to consider all of those things when we are thinking about these medications. Um, in this particular uh, slide, all I really wanted to do was just demonstrate a visual picture of what the mechanism actually is. So this is more of a general um, picture here, but what we can see here is this is the presynaptic terminal. This is the postsynaptic terminal. These are the vesicles containing our neurotransmitter, in this case, serotonin. Now these vesicles fuse with the membrane here and they're going to release serotonin into the synaptic cleft. This space between these two neurons, basically the pre um, presynaptic terminal and postsynaptic terminal is known as a synaptic cleft, right? And these receptors are the ones we're trying to stimulate with the increased serotonin. Now what happens is this cleft actually, you begin clearing the serotonin out of here pretty much immediately as soon as it's released by transporters like this one right here where it's going to reuptake re re or retake up the, the serotonin back into the presynaptic terminal. So what we want to do is we want to block this and we want to increase the amount of serotonin and really increase the length of time that the serotonin remains within this space here. So that's essentially what you're trying to do with these types of medications. So let's talk a little bit about the side effect profile of these medications. Um, the general reason for these side effects is because not only are you increasing serotonin in the brain, but you're also increasing it in other parts of the body as well. So it's this increase in serotonin in other parts of the body that leads to some of the symptoms that we see. Um, another important fact here, I feel like, is that you need to understand that these the feelings or the side effects are very subjective. It can vary from person to person. So one person can take a medication and say like, wow, that medication was very sedating. I really felt out of it. I didn't feel like I had much energy. Whereas the other person can take the same medication and say, wow, that was very activating. I felt like I had more energy. I, I couldn't sleep at night. I even had insomnia, etc. So it really depends and varies from person to person. That's why it's very important to, um, you know, monitor those things and make treatment decisions on an individual basis, on a case-by-case -case basis. So some of the most common side effects we see are things like nausea, and each one of these is, again, related to serotonin receptors in different parts of the body. So for the nausea, it's receptors that are located in the hypothalamus and the brainstem. For mental agitation, it gets receptors in the amygdala and limbic cortex. The motor symptoms, such as restlessness or psychomotor retardation that can be seen, are related to receptors found in the basal ganglia. You can have insomnia, which is related to receptors in the brainstem. And one of the very classic board questions is the sexual dysfunctions which can uh, include decreased libido, impotence, anorgasmia, etc. And this is related to serotonin uh, receptors located in the mesocortical and spinal cord. So another common side effect, or probably one of the more common side effects, is actually GI disturbance. So people can have cramps, they can have diarrhea, etc. And that's because the GI tract is loaded with serotonin receptors. And so when we increase serotonin, through these mechanisms, we're also increasing um, the serotonin available to bind to the receptors in the GI tract. And the last thing I want to talk about in this video is really just kind of the three phases of treatment that a person will go through if they choose to use one of these medications. The first phase is actually the acute phase, and that's going from the first dose of the medication until the patient's asymptomatic. And I said in the previous slides, three to six weeks, four to six weeks, it depends on which text you're going by. But somewhere in that three to six week range um, is the acute phase. The continuation phase, the goal in the continuation phase is to obviously avoid relapse. We don't want people to continue to have uh, major depressive episodes throughout their life. We hope to treat them and that they get better and that they never come and see us again. That really is truly the goal. But in order to make that happen, it's really appropriate to carry out the same treatment for a minimal of six months and sometimes longer depending on the way things are going, depending on the patient's response. Um, but a minimal of six months at the same dose that achieves remission. So that would be your continuation phase. And the maintenance phase is not for every person. In a lot of cases, if the person feels much better, maybe they've developed some behavioral techniques, maybe they've connected with a therapist that they're really happy with, and they're making a lot of strides, and they're, and they're not feeling as depressed anymore, or not feeling depressed at all anymore, 
and they're on their way to a happy, healthy life, they can be tapered off of the medication and may not require any kind of pharmacological intervention from that point forward. However, for patients who may be at high risk of relapse, say someone who's had multiple episodes of depression that, and people who have been hospitalized for it, people who have uh, had suicide attempts, um, people with a strong family predisposition for depression, they may be appropriate candidates to continue long-term therapy. And long-term therapy in many cases is actually lifelong. So that about wraps up most of what I wanted to talk about in this video, and we're going to continue on in the next videos with um, some other classifications or classes of medications, such as, and I'll probably start with the uh, SNRIs or serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors in the next video.